A Third of the Stars, Part 2. My name is Daniel Vallis, and welcome to our channel. Brother Nathaniel and Sister Shanna have sent in more pictures from July 27th, just showing us the state of the figs over there. They're still pretty green. There's still a few that are turning purple, and some that are becoming ripe early, but overall they are still very, very green, which is one of the pictures we've been looking at in the Song of Solomon. And also connected to the book of Revelation, describing how the stars are going to fall, like a fig tree that is shaken of a mighty wind. How she casts forth her untimely, her unripe figs. So, amazing agricultural pictures that we see even right now, this time of the green figs, while we're awaiting our beloved. And the tender grapes are on the vine. The grapes that the benders have, they're pretty ripe now, but they're still on the vine. And just like we heard in the vineyard tour, their main harvest was going to be later in the month. But we're at a time right now of tender grapes and the green figs. So a lot of agricultural pictures that tell us the timing with prophetic events also. So many pictures in scripture using agricultural word pictures and tied to prophetic events. Even with the serpent dragon, Draco, that we've been looking at. And this is what we've been studying in Revelation 12, getting an understanding of the timing of this celestial sign that's described here. Because it's described over a period of time. And while there's a lot of people that give focus on just the woman part of it and they ignore the other part, the dragon part, they go together. And the dragon part is 50% of the sign. And one thing to keep in mind is both of these parts, the woman part and the dragon part, they're both time-lapse prophecy. The woman prophecy, it's a time-lapse of over the different months of her pregnancy. It's already been going on for several months. The same with the dragon. It also involves a time period a progression over time. The dragon part is taking place before the woman gives birth. And so the more that we understand how these two go together and how they interact, we'll have a better understanding of the timing when we should be expecting these celestial events to start and also the events that they're connected with. Because September 23rd is the finish of this celestial sign. Whereas we are warned with the dragon part that there's going to be significant events and a time of travail before September 23rd. And so, breaking it down, John tells us that the woman part is a sign. He sees this sign in heaven. It's rehearsing a familiar story, but it takes place in heaven. It uses the sun, the moon, the stars. So, he is seeing a literal event take place. It's a sign. It has a recognizable message. And then later on in the chapter, John also describes other events that are taking place in addition to these signs, and so don't confuse the signs and the events that are happening at the same time. They are described separately. The signs tell us what is about to happen. And so we got to keep separately the sign from the events. There are signs that are recognizable and are visible. And so the first sign, the first wonder, the first token, the first signal that he describes is a woman who is with child, but she has not given birth yet. And John lets us know that she is travailing in birth. She is going through labor pains right now. She's even screaming. She has not brought forth the child yet, but she is already in labor pains. And apparently the birth date is when the sun and the moon are all together. All the celestial actors are together on that day. That's when she's screaming the most, travailing in birth. And that's going to be the birthing day, which we know as September 23rd. But then John describes another sign, another wonder, going on in heaven at the same time. And it's also a time lapse over time. And he's looking backwards a little bit in time of what it's doing leading up to this birth date. When the sun and moon are all together with the woman's sign. The dragon's going to be doing some things leading up to this time, up to this birth date. And he mentions that there's three different phases. Number one, his tail is going to draw the third part of the stars of heaven. And so he's describing a celestial movement on the celestial clock. And this is what we've been trying to understand and get a deeper understanding of. What does it mean by his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven? And how much is that third part of? It's a relative term. And so we've been looking more deeply into this. And we've been getting a very good understanding. But John lets us know that this celestial sweep of one-third of the stars of heaven comes before the stars are actually cast down to the earth. This is a physical event. They're not just seen up in the heavens whizzing by or something. They are actually coming and falling down and impacting on earth. So again, they're not shooting stars. They're things that are falling down and actually impacting on the earth. 
And it's interesting that around this time is the Perseid meteor shower that's going on. But I just want to contrast this, that this is not what the Revelation passage is talking about. For example, the Perseid meteor shower that is going on right now, it's the most popular meteor shower of the year. But notice that they say rates will be about half what they would be normally because of the bright moonlight, Cook told Space.com. Instead of 80 to 100 meteors per hour, there will be 40 to 50 meteors per hour. And that's just because the moon's going to wash out the fainter ones. Okay, so just think about this for a moment. The most popular meteor shower of the year only has a typical rate of about 80 meteors an hour. And at high outbursts, 150 to 200 meteors an hour. So the most popular meteor shower of the year is very small considering what is described in Revelation 12 where he says a third of the stars are falling. Very significant, very different. John is not describing a meteor shower. He's describing things actually falling down and happening a lot. It's going to be a very significant time. It is interesting that this perceived meteor shower will peak overnight on August 12th and 13th. So it reminds us of these events, but again, it's going to be very few. And it's happening toward the north in Perseus, which is just below the Little Dipper. And Draco is above the Little Dipper. But again, not in the same area, nowhere near the mountain rate of what's described in Revelation 12. These are not the same. And even this year is only going to be about half of what it normally would be. While we do not know exactly what Revelation 12 is talking about, the stars falling to earth, we do know they are going to fall down to the earth. They are going to impact the earth. And it's probably going to be very like the fireball that happened in Chilablinsk, Russia, not too long ago. It caught a lot of media's attention. It's going to be impacting the earth. And that's what John describes. And that's what he's warning about. This is a warning. It's to let us know this is not about a meteor shower or just some fireworks show up in the heavens. No, he's saying... A time of travail is coming. The woman is travailing in labor during this time, and the stars of heaven are going to fall to the earth, and they're going to be impacting the earth. And once that is done, the dragon will be in place, facing before the woman, not under her feet, in front of, before the woman, who is about to give birth. And so again, re-emphasizing multiple times, John is letting us know, all this dragon celestial sign events are taking place before the woman even gives birth. And that's what we need to pay attention to. The warning is about what happens before September 23rd. Too many people are looking at September 23rd and too many people are ignoring and actually censoring this dragon event here. It's a warning for us. Let us know. We're not looking toward September 23rd because we warned there's going to be significant events that are happening before that date, before she gives birth. And only after the tail draws a third part of the stars of heaven. And only after those are cast to the earth. Then the dragon will stand before the woman. That will happen on September 23rd. You won't see all those things together, particularly with the sun there, until right around September 23rd. But John is warning us the dragon tail is going to be drawing a third of the stars and casting them to the earth before the woman gives birth. And then she will give birth after that takes place. So both of these signs, the sign with the woman and the sign with the dragon, both of them will complete on September 23rd. Both of them are time-lapse prophecies that will happen leading up to and finishing. Finishing and completing on September 23rd. But the time of travail is before September 23rd. And this is what we've been warned about in Scripture multiple times. Jesus himself warned us that the powers of heaven are going to be shaken and the stars are going to fall from heaven before the sign of the Son of Man completes, before it appears, before all those celestial actors get together on that one day of September 23rd. And John also again reemphasized in Revelation chapter 12, rehearsing the events that Christ warned about with the stars falling to the earth. And then Paul and Timothy also warned about the time of sudden destruction coming as travail upon a woman with child. There is going to be a significant time of distress and travail before September 23rd. And we've been trying to get a better understanding of the celestial sign described about how the tail will sweep and draw a third of the stars of heaven. Trying to understand what exactly is that talking about? How many stars is he seeing? What's the dragon tail working with? How much of the heavens is being drawn? And so in our previous videos, the Lord has been giving understanding, narrowing down and giving us more and more clear understanding about exactly how this could be working. And it's amazing how the Lord keeps giving more wisdom, getting a clearer picture of the same thing. It hasn't been changing, it's just been getting a clearer picture of the same thing. Especially the more as we put ourselves into the shoes of John and 
what someone would be observing that celestial sign, what they would see. The more we put ourselves through that, the more we understand what he's describing. And so in our last video, we talked about the difference between the length of day and night, especially between now and September 23rd. And that really affects the third of the night sky and the night scene that John was describing in that time lapse that would lead up to September 23rd. Just with that understanding that told us there were fewer stars that the tail was sweeping over that time lapse than what we had assumed just going with 180 degrees or equal days and nights. But as I was thinking about this some more and I've been thinking about this the past few days, we already understand that the days are longer than the nights right now. And so that helped narrow down our window of expectation a little bit more. But then I was thinking not all the stars come out right away as soon as the sun sets. There's a time between when the sun sets, the end of daylight, and there's a transition time before all the stars come out. And so the actual window of the stars being out is even smaller than what we've been assuming so far. We've been narrowing down our understanding. We've been getting closer and closer. But this is interesting to see the more we rehearse how this celestial clock works. And the more we actually go out and observe it and try to put ourselves into John's shoes of what he said he saw. And just like the pictures we took the other day, they were taken about 8 o'clock at night. After the sun had set, sometime before that, but all the stars had not come out yet, although a few of the brighter ones were visible. And most of us know that as soon as the sun sets on the horizon, you're not going to see any stars as soon as the sun sets, as soon as it reaches the horizon. But about half hour after the sun sets, you'll start seeing some of the brightest stars and ones that have a brighter magnitude. The ones that stick out a lot more, you'll start seeing them about half hour after the sun sets. But you really have to wait about an hour after the sun sets before you can really see most of the stars that you are going to see just with your naked eye. And we have to put ourselves into the shoes of them back then. They didn't have telescopes. They weren't waiting for it to be super dark. What would they see with just their unaided eye? Well, about an hour after sunset, you're going to see most of the stars that you will see over the night. If you wait an hour and a half after sunset, then you will reach what's known as astronomical twilight. And that's about as dark as it's going to get. And that's when the really, really faint stars can be seen. And that's when you have the best viewing opportunity for telescopes and whatnot. And so this is something we need to think about and keep in mind when we do our calculations of what John saw. How many stars he saw and what portion of the heavens was being swept. What portion of the stars were being divided into a third. Because the stars don't immediately pop out as soon as the sun hits the horizon. And it also works the other way on sunrise too as well. The stars start disappearing for a while before the sun rises. So even though the sun isn't seen, all the stars aren't seen either. There are different degrees. And normally astronomical twilight will be about an hour and a half after the sun sets. But generally for the average person, a rule of thumb also recognized is about an hour after sunset, you're pretty much going to see all the stars that you will see with your unaided eye. Only about an hour and a half after sunset will you be able to see the most faintest stars that you would see. And so taking the twilight time into consideration, I read the calculations to add that twilight time while all the stars aren't out yet. I've recalculated to figure out what is the time when the stars aren't seen and what is the time that they're mostly going to be seen. If we add an hour's amount of twilight at sunrise and sunset, Mainly because after an hour, you're pretty much going to see most of the stars that you will see. And so if we add that into the equation, that gives us a better understanding of when are the actual stars out. And when we have an idea of that time frame, then we'll have a better understanding of seeing over a time lapse, a tail sweep, the portion that the stars are actually out. And so here's just a calculation of adding a half hour after sunset. And you'll start to be able to see a number of the stars, but not until an hour after sunset and an hour before sunrise will you really see the stars. And so, of course, this makes for a smaller time frame that these stars are actually out. And so if the tail is sweeping that smaller portion, that makes the third of that portion even smaller. And so just compensating for an hour's twilight at either end, that brings us to an average of 44.05 degrees. Which, if we look on our calendar again, on August 9th, the sun will be about 44 degrees away from where it will be on September 23rd. So the celestial heavens will still have 44 degrees still to rotate before September 23rd. Here's another way to look at it. 
When we first did our rough estimations, we were going with 180 degrees, equal day and equal night, and that was because we knew John was seeing the horizon view, so he's only seeing half of the celestial sphere. And so we just did that rough estimate of assuming he was only seeing 180 degrees. A night that is 180 degrees would be equally divided in two-thirds of 60 degrees. And on July 22nd, 23rd, the sun was 60 degrees away from where it will be on September 23rd. So that was the start of a third going on a very rough estimate and understanding of how the day and night cycles work. And then the Lord gave understanding that the days and nights aren't equal. They're not equally divided into 180 degrees yet, although they pretty much will be on September 23rd. But right now the day is much larger than the night period. And so in our last video we divided that portion into thirds and then figured out a linear average over that time which would bring us to 53.85 average. Over this time lapse, observing while Draco is rotating toward where it will be on September 23rd, if we averaged out what it's going to be doing and the stars that it's working with in that time, an average would be 53.85, which the sun, and hence the celestial movements, will still have that much to rotate still toward September 23rd. On July 29th, 30th, around here, is when the heavens would still have that average still to rotate toward that September 23rd date. But the problem with this is that it assumes that the stars pop out as soon as the sun sets. But that is not correct, although that has certainly helped us narrow down our understanding. When we take into account the twilight time, and just going by an hour after sunset and an hour before sunrise, that narrows down the window of when the stars are actually out. An hour after sunset, this time period is pretty much when you're going to see most of all the stars as you could see. It could get a little bit darker, but pretty much an hour afterwards you'll see pretty much everything you will see. So this makes the window even smaller of what the heavens would be working with. And so an one hour twilight compensated average third, that would be 44.05 degrees, and the heavens would reach that on August 9th, right around there. You'll still have 44 degrees still to rotate before September 23rd, and hence the dragon would be rotating that same amount, a third of those stars, in that time period. So where we are now between these two averages, this gives us a working window, a minimum and a maximum. A minimum of not taking twilight into account at all, just going with a possible start, the minimum that it could start at, of that night portion working with all that, but then also a max that it could start out. If we did assume and compensate for the twilight period, then of course that narrows down the stars that Draco would be working with. And so we're still in about the same window of our best understanding of when the third duration would start. And again, this is when it would start, possibly start. We've been getting a clear understanding of how the heavens work and when the stars are out and an average of that time lapse. And we have a pretty good idea of when that tail time could technically start. And so we can't state definitively, but this is our best understanding. And we keep narrowing down and the Lord keeps giving wisdom. We do know sometime right around here, it's going to be hitting a celestial marker on the celestial clock of when the tail would start its one-third sweep of the stars of heaven. And that is what John described that he saw. And so we have to take into account what was he seeing and how was he seeing it. And he was describing a time lapse, so we have to keep that into account as well. He's seeing Draco's tail over time. And so as we get an average of what we think he saw, that gives us a best understanding of approximately when it would start. And when we know it starts, then we have a pretty good idea of sometime after that point, the stars are going to be falling. And we also know they're going to be falling before the woman gives birth because the dragon sign is going to be finished on September 23rd. And so we do this research to give us an understanding of scripture, and that's a warning for us. This information was given as a warning, so we would know what's on the horizon. And this backs up our understanding to where we are now. When we look on the timeline, we're in an approximate time of when the dragon's tail time would start. Right around here, 
this is our best understanding we keep narrowing it down but so far the average maximum start would be august 9th the maximum time that it could start and of course right now we're in a very interesting and amazing prophetic time the time of the tender grapes and the time of the green figs in this month of pruning and harvesting the second month for grapes we are at a time where the prophetic pictures the celestial pictures and the agricultural pictures are coming together in this time right here so many pictures coming together reminding us that we know time is running out we know the revelation 12 date the september 23rd is coming up we know the dragon tail time the time of travail is about to start the time of sudden destruction is about to start again there's a lot we don't know but there's a lot that we do know where we are right now the agricultural pictures the celestial pictures that we do know going on we know so much about where we are right now and what's on the horizon we know with the agricultural picture and the, just the general agricultural calendar we're in the time of grapes and we're also just under a month away from when the figs are going to be harvested and processed where we are right now we're at a time of green figs right now we're at a time of grapes still on the vine the tender grapes they're very tender right now they're very ripe we're at a time of expectation awaiting our beloved and we're also aware that he himself has warned us of the events that are on the horizon when the stars do fall they're going to be falling like a fig tree who casts forth her untimely her unripe figs so we're not surprised at all to see the agricultural pictures reminding us of the green figs right at this time when we are expecting the dragon tail time to start which is related to the stars falling we see the celestial warnings lining up with the agricultural time we have multiple things telling us this time where we are right now is a time of great expectation but it's also a sober time reminding us of what's on the horizon we should be looking for our beloved now remembering what he has said we need to have an ear to hear what he saith unto the churches which includes the information in the revelation 12 sign about the dragon tail time the time of travail and how the stars will fall from heaven before september 23rd if we ignore the dragon sign we can't say we're having an ear to hear because that's what we are told to listen to and be aware of and take heed to and live in light that it backs up our understanding of our expectation for our beloved to now the time of the green figs the time of the tender grapes right now is when we are expecting our beloved because we are listening to what he has told us and it should not surprise us that at this time we're coming up on the ninth of av which is going to be on august third and fourth because the new moon was not sighted on the 24th when it was expected to and so that delayed the fifth month by one day so the ninth of av is on august 3rd and 4th and that directly relates to when the children of israel did not believe god's promises about the promised land because they believed a false report about the land they did not listen to their lord and this time of the 12 spies that went into the promised land and brought back a report it's associated with the grapes the ripe grapes that they brought back to show the people how god's promises were true about the bountifulness of the land they brought back proof that god's word and his promises about that land were true and he just wanted the people to go forward but they did not believe the lord they turned their ear to listening to the evil reports friend this is a sober reminder for us we're at a time of tender grapes we're at a time when we are to remember the promises of our beloved and his instructions that he gave us his warnings and his exhortations about the future and also the time of expectation for him we're at this time the time of the green figs the time of the tender grapes we're here we also have the instructions by our lord that he gave to the churches about what's on the horizon we're at a time now of who are we going to listen to are we listening to the words of our beloved are we listening to what scripture says are we listening to the spirit which reminds us what our beloved says we're at a time of expectation let's look at what he has told us to look at and also be aware of what he has warned about it's on the horizon we're at a time of tender grapes we're at a time of green figs we're at a time that reminds us to believe his promises about the future and to go forward in faith that this is a time of expectation we need to be living as though our bridegroom cometh we have seen so many things we've looked up we've lifted up our heads so many things telling us this is a time of expectation our redemption is nigh even at the doors we have great expectation for him now also warned about what is on the horizon the time of travail the time of sudden destruction is about to start 
Are we listening to Scripture's warnings? Are we listening to Scripture's instructions? When we go outside and we look up and we lift up our heads, we need to be reminded about what has Scripture said. The Revelation 12 sign, the woman and the dragon sign, which is a warning for the churches, which is a warning to tell us things are on the horizon that we need to be aware of and we need to be living as though time is shorter than we think. A significant time of travail is about to start any day now. We have the celestial clock reminding us in the heavens right now. We have the agricultural clock reminding us right now. Are we listening? Are we listening? Are we believing scripture? Christ warned several times in scripture that he is coming during the days of Noah and Lot, before any major world events happen. Noah and his family entered into the ark on a perfectly normal day. Judgment came in one day. But if you're waiting for major worldwide disasters to happen before you start waking up, then you are looking for the wrong thing. Christ warned his servants that he is coming while life is still going on like normal. This is why we need to pay attention to his instructions and what he has told us to look for. The same with the account of Lot and his family. They left Sodom and Gomorrah on a perfectly normal day. People were still waking up, getting ready for work, making breakfast, and Lot and his family were walking out of town. Judgment had not come yet. Destruction had not come yet. And this is the warning that Christ gave his disciples. He is coming during the days of Noah and Lot, while life is still going on like normal. Nothing has disrupted it. None of the tribulation seals have opened yet. He is coming while life is still going on like normal. And this is why he warned his servants, remember Lot's wife. Now is when we need to be setting our heart and affections on things above, living while the rest of the world is pursuing everything else. We need to be setting our heart and affection on things above, living for our Redeemer, making sure our loins are girded about, make sure our lamps are burning. We are expecting the evacuation while life is still going on like normal. But then sudden destruction is coming. And we've been warned about it. We know sudden destruction is coming. We know a time of travail is coming. We've even been told about the celestial clock of when to expect it. We see this on the horizon. Is that changing how we live? It should. We need to be applying ourselves to be the wise servants. To making sure we are ready. To make sure our loins are girded about. To make sure our lamps are burning. To make sure we're not like Lot's wife. To make sure we are living as though our Lord and our Master, our Redeemer, our Beloved, and our Bridegroom is about to return. If you have not yet, definitely download our booklet, Be Ye Ready, where we recount a lot of Christ's warnings to his servants of Beware the Tribulation Snare. He has warned us several times he is coming during the days of Noah and Lot. And if we are not ready, we will be caught in the Tribulation Snare. And we also have the article, They Build It and They Plan It, talking about living in the days of Noah and Lot. Are we like Lot's wife? Are we ignoring all the signs that our Lord has given us to warn us that sun destruction is coming? A time of perplexity, Christ warned his disciples about. This time that is on the horizon. During this time of celestial events associated with the Revelation 12 sign, the woman and the dragon. We've been forewarned about this multiple times. Are we listening and living according to the instructions that have been given? If you have not yet, definitely download the Revelation chapter 12 sign as well. A lot of material in there. We're at a time when we need to be looking up. We need to be lifting up our heads now. And we also need to be looking into God's word, getting a better understanding of his instructions that he has left us. And living in light of it. Believing his promises. Going forward in faith. This is what we're going to do. And as we see the day approaching, as we see that we're here at this moment right now, we know our redemption is not even at the doors. As we see this day approaching, we need to be encouraging one another unto love and to good works. We need to be praying for each other, and if you have any prayer requests, let us know. We will pray for you. Now is also a good time to remind us about things you may have asked for before. Just remind us, because we can pray for you, we can pray for each other, we can encourage each other. And this is what we are told to do, and so much the more, as we see the day approaching. How will we know the day is approaching? Because we will see it if we look up and we lift up our heads and we look at what Scripture tells us, what our Bridegroom tells us, and what the Spirit saith unto the churches. If we listen and if we look up, then we will know the day is approaching. We have heard so many trumpet calls, the prophetic trumpet calls, the agricultural trumpet calls, the celestial trumpet calls, telling us our Bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. When we know he is coming, that should affect how we live. We should be rising up. We should be trimming our lamps. We should be casting off the works of darkness and setting aside any weights that hold us back from drawing nigh to our beloved, to our Redeemer, to our King, to our Master. And so let us draw nigh to him, let us love him, and let us serve him. 
first and highest above all else, Maranatha.